All right, this is going to be lecture three on the aspects of Tantra, Hinduism, and traditional Aryanism. Last time we spoke specifically about the lower chakras going down the legs. Um, and then we got into um, the subtle body. So we're going to start with focusing on the subtle body in the beginning. The subtle body is what you call the spirit. It is the aspect that is basically runs along your nervous systems and the energy points in the chakras in the middle chakras, lower chakras too, but more the middle chakras that also combines with your subconscious mind and all the gunas and so forth that we talked about last time. Um, now, to make impressions on the subtle body, uh, it's what we do. So for example, they call them indrayas, obviously coming from Indra, um, and these are what they call an active expressions, specifically the Karman Karma and dry is obviously relating to karma. It should be self-evident because it's actions. Um, and then if you look at it, it follows um, your middle line chakras, starting at the base with eliminating, obviously going to the bathroom, taking a shit, passing it. So it's a physical expression, an active expression. Um, you can build karma by how you shit, where you shit, what you shit, what you do with the shit, so on and so on. Like flinging shit's probably a sin. <laughs> <laughs> Shaking the village well is probably off the frying pan. Yeah, most likely. Um, they they nicely use the term reproduction. It should actually be orgasm, ejaculation, or squirting, depending. But it's the actual act of the the juice coming out of the human body of the genitals. Obviously, that can build karma either way. It should be self-evident. Um, then we get into moving, and obviously that matches the next chakra. Then moving up to the to the next chakra, moving with the feet, specifically moving around, walking around, doing whatever, which is going to also matches the many pure chakra, which is it judges over the feet and movement stuff like that. Then you move into hands, which is grasping heart chakra. You know, whatever you do with your works, your workings, and on a hatha chakra, we've discussed that many times. The green thing, blah blah blah. Um, and then speaking, obviously from the throat, again the blasphemy, the, the, the speech being the main thing that is the conduit into the spiritual realm, blah blah blah. Makes sense? They have specific names and they are what make karma. Hmm. That's really interesting. These are, the, these are the factors that attribute to your karma. Yep. These are the physical things that you do, the active expressions of yourself and your physical body to create the karma, no matter what you do. Does that make sense? These are all the things that you do at the most base level. Hmm. That's pretty heavy. Uh, yeah, basic peopling. So. Yeah. Then you get into, uh, the, the, the ten go together, by the way. This first five and the second five all go together. So your next five are your cognitive senses or uh, Jane A. Dryas, like Jainism, pure knowledgeism. So it gets into how you create the impressions on your subtle body. And those are brought by the your senses or your sensations. And I go from um, the highest potential for making an impression on the subtle body by starting with smell. Because smell has a tendency to be the most thing that we remember the easiest. And that will, will bring that impression on the subtle body harder because it hits the subconscious directly as well. You can't taste anything without smelling it. That should be self-evident. Um, seeing is very big in this. These are always bringing in lots of information, tons of information. In fact, you're bringing in so much information, your subconscious mind is always trying to figure out ways to um, bring down the amount of information. So in other words, if you're looking at a spot in a room, um, your subconscious, about the only thing you're really seeing is right here, and your subconscious fills in the rest of your conscious mind. Because your, your mind has to filter through so much as through sight. So that's why it doesn't leave so much of an impression of smelling, because it's a lot to process through. Hmm. Um, touching, I mean that's the furthest away from the subtle body as anything can be, it's because it's really? got to go through all the flesh and all the bones and all the nerves and everything else. So when you're touching something, it's very difficult to make an impression unless it's something where you're like inserting a knife into somebody. 
That's going to leave an impression because it's puncturing directly through to the actual subject body itself. But if it's all exterior... Like scratches or slashes? Yeah. Hmm. But if it actually penetrates into the body and penetrates into the subtle body, then you'll have a really good impression. Well, that's interesting, uh, the connotations of, like, you know, um, the arrow being shot by the god and, and piercing you being so powerful, or the bow or the arrow being, like, the sun god's weapon, things like that, speaks a lot to it. Hmm. Yeah, so when you have that direct, you're directly affecting the subtle body at that point. Interesting. And then hearing is the, the last, because we, our minds tune out more hearing than it does anything else. If you actually learn to meditate properly, and get really, really quiet and still within yourself, you should be able to hear within a half mile to a mile of everything that's going on if you close your mind down enough to do so. <laughs> but that's how much the subconscious is constantly shutting out everything that we hear, so that's why it doesn't make such an impression on this little body because of all the blockage from the subconscious mind. Does that make sense? It's like a filter. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's really not much else to say. Uh, the whole thing is in dry eyes. Like I said, those are two separate. They're, um, they're just the expressions or the absorptions that we get, the primary functions, if you will. Easiest thing. Um, so keeping with this concept, we're going to move into the, the values of prana, the different types of air and energy that the body uses. Obviously, the first one is prana, which is breathing, and it also goes over the circulatory system, which brings us back to speaking or smelling and keeps that going. So regular prana is breath. Breath controls everything. And we'll get into later on which nostril you breathe through, what part of the nostril you breathe in affects which particular particular of the primary divisions. And also which particularly affect the two major um, nerves that go all the way down the spine, they crisscross. We'll get into those at a later date. Um, apana is eliminating waste, pooping, peeing, menstruation, crying, spitting, whatever. And it's the already money aspect of what we're doing. Um, anytime you see anything like apana, or anytime, especially in Hindu uh, words, if A is in front of it, it's either an opposite or a negative to something else that helps. So the negative of relieving yourself of waste. Udana is again the vocal sounds, singing, speaking, those types of things. It's a different type of energy. And this type of energy hooks into the spiritual energy. And that's what they're talking about when they, when you're, the Udana starts at the Mohaldara chakra, the base chakra, and it moves up, goes through the elements, gets to the heart and it gets to where it can be intoned and it's intoned out. And that's that type of energy. It's called Indana energy. How is that different from prana? Is prana just like regular breathing? Prana is just yeah, regular breathing and specifically prana is also energy from the sun. Hmm. So for example, I was, I've been working on this myself, uh, close your eyes and stare into the sun and make sure that the sun is hitting the third eye directly. Um, and also, so it also hits the uh, many pure chakra directly too, because that solar energy is what recharges the solar chakra. And also, what charges Agni, or Agni, that we use to communicate with the Deva. And when you're taking that in, that sunlight, directly into the uh, third eye, it decalcifies the uh, pineal gland. And it also opens up the ability to project out of it too. Now, when you close your eyes and you're looking straight up, it's, it's red as shit. You should be able to see the veins and crap that are in your eyelids. And it takes a little bit, it takes about 30 seconds to, for it to settle. And when you actually take it in, as long as you can withstand it, because it does, you got to build a tolerance to it. And um, when you get out of the sun and open your eyes back up, from my experience, my vision has been clearer, colors have been more crisp, I have a higher energy level than I did before. So it's a whole different, prana is mainly breath, but it's also energy from the sun too. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because without the without the energy, the specific energy from the sun for all living things, nothing would live. Plants wouldn't live, animals wouldn't live, and then supposedly, according to Hindu mythos, the water would come out of the earth and go into space. 
And as the sun's rays, it holds the water down into the oceans and stuff. Yeah, sure, why not? Like, yeah. I just thought I'd add that tidbit in. It doesn't make sense to me unless they're specifically talking about the gravitational field between the Earth and the sun, and that might be... But I'm not going to speak for the people. That's just what they said. Um, then Samana, digestion, your internal heat regulations. Again, it's going to it's going to affect the the Mani Pura, but it's going to be specifically for keeping yourself warm, dealing with your body temperature. Um, so if you get this your this area the coldest, then that's when you're going to get the most heat burning here. So if you have a high level of prana or a high level of the values energies and you're really hot, that means you're on that burning desire. And that burning desire creates that, you know, when you're just too hot and you're just profusely sweating like old lady having a, a hot flash of menopause. Kind of <laughs> that regulation of the internal heat, does that make sense? And then uh, Vayana is the expressions of expansions and contractions of your muscles. So it's the energy that you use to do push-ups, sit-ups, grab things, pull, push, your physical energy. Hmm. Kind of like the use of your own kinetic energy. Yeah. Awesome. Don't ask me why all this is separated. I don't know. Just we're going to go over it. It's, it's really interesting. It'll make sense once we get into the further weeks. you got to have all the components first. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, in majority of magical schools, you have the four elements, the four quarters, maybe five, depending on what you're doing. You know, the, the elements of water, earth, fire, air, and possibly spirit, depending on what school you're dealing with. Well, if you guys haven't figured out, when it comes to that type of stuff, the Hindus is eight. The Dikpala was originally eight. Guardians, the above and below, came later on, after Vedic Hinduism, actually. <clears throat> and your primary divisions, obviously, are the elements, just like I spoke. And it just goes right up the chakra pathways. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, or spirit. That makes sense. Um, Manus is the invisible. Invisible conduit. So, like, for example, um, here you're talking to your throat. Now you're talking... So, <clears throat> would Manas kind of be like thought then, maybe? Yes and no. Ether is a spirit. Manas is like mind. Let me see what is specifically I have written down. That's the best way to describe it. It's spirit sense. It's, it's where you begin um, the city being the, the supernatural powers begin with what they call spiritual sense organs. Because in each chakra, there is a guardian devata, which we've already talked about. Those devatas, when open and the chakras open, spun, blah, 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 and you get the guardian of the chakra to allow it to sit so the snake can come up, it opens that up, which gives you the city, which begins the spirit sense. And that's where the manas, is where the spirit senses begin. So that you can, like, uh, you can feel the invisible around you, speak to the invisible around you, have telekinesis, telecommunication, you know, like speaking mind to mind, things like this, or feel other things, empathy. That's where the manas start. There are low level versions of cities. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Your minor psychic powers, if you will, that also help you communicate with the spiritual realm. So if these are in alignment, these are the things that people are using to communicate to the other. That's, that's awesome. That's great. And so these are the ones that everybody can do. Yeah. And then the, the buddy, we've already discussed the buddy. Mm. That's the aspect of, that's always... Trying to get you to return to the right-hand path. Yes. One of the things that I didn't bring up to you guys yet, which we're going to tonight, is the, re the way we fight these. When we do the Dick Paul, we do the hymns. Mm -hmm. When we sing the hymns or we say the hymns, that's what immediately strikes the buddy to go with and we move it towards the entities that we're dealing with. So if we're humming those and we're seeing those, that affects that directly to direct at the entities that we're working with. And that way that helps fight that from wanting to go to the positive entities or the righteous entities. Okay, instead of making it face us, we make it face them. Yes. Nice. 
So are, does that mean that we're shifting the booty so that our intentions... That's how we're going to corrupt it, yes. We're going to uh, corrupt the booty by singing the hymns the way that we have them written so that we can take that and focus on our guys versus having to fight those guys. So theoretically, I've got to ask you then, is this the concept of the guardian angel or is this the concept of the right-hand path spirituality in yourself? Like consciousness, the conscience, I mean. Like... You know, everyone says, this is your conscience speaking whenever you're uh, supposed to do, like, the right thing or whatever. No, that's that's um, internal built morality by how your parents raised you, is what hmm. that is. What you're talking about, is is that supposed to be the the Jungian and the Aleister Crowleyan concept of the higher self or the guardian angel or whatever the fuck they call that shit? Yeah, the Favrashi, you know, that, that uh, kind of thing. I was. Yeah. No, not from what I've seen. Okay. It's more of a driving force within the spirit to want specifically peace, love, bliss, okay. all of those things. Or unity. Yeah. So it is a piece of you. Yeah, it's an internal piece of your... It's actually part of the mind. Because remember how we talked about um, the different aspects of the mind in the first week? Mm-hmm. And booty was one of them that went along with it? Yeah. That's part of the aspects of the mind. And that's the part that we corrupt through the hymns. Those hymns are what feed that energy. Hmm. Obviously, the praise that we're giving to the gods, too. But that's how you're getting that specific part of yourself in line with those entities. Okay. And that's where the communication goes through with you and those entities as well. I can dig it. That's why we have to corrupt it. Hmm. I didn't want to overload you guys with that kind of shit last week or the week before. Because it's all going to keep building on itself. And then we have the aha kara, which is the I will. That's, that's your will, your projection into all of it. So if you have the elements lined up, you're lined up in the spirit realm, you have the ability to communicate with the spirit realm, your mind and the entities that you're dealing with are locked in together, then your will and that entity's will will create the reality. Nice. It's dope. Makes sense now? Makes a, this, a lot of sense. Which is why you have to get all of your chakras, boom, 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 make sure that they're in line, got the energy done, you are in system with all the guardians, everybody knows everybody, everybody's on the set plane, everything's lined up, and just light, 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 boom. So just think of it like a really long street light. It's got to go through all those different things. Ding, 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 ding. And then finally, once you have everything open, it comes out of the Ajna Chakra. The only purpose for opening the Crown Chakra is to have the ego death like you described so that you can tap into Brahma. And that's what we're, we're going to avoid that at all costs. Yeah, it's not an experience I'd recommend more than once. Yeah, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to be one with Brahma. So, when we do the Kundalini... <laughs> We're going to, once I get, once I get through the left hand path stuff, Tantra, it should be able to show me where they use the serpent power to cap right onto the Sasara chakra, the crown chakra, after it's open so that it pushes everything back through. Hmm. And then it seals you off from Rama. So that way if we hit Ariman, because Ariman's already a piece of Purusha, we swing off into the Purusha, and now we can still have the same power that they have using the Brahma, but we're going to use the outside of the Purusha. Hmm. That's deep. Make more sense. Because there's no way that we shouldn't be able to have the same amount of power, the same amount of ability that they have, but just a different way. Fuck them. Well, if Shiva went from being a flower to beating the head of the Pantheon, why can't we do that as well? Well, yeah, and you also have to remember Shiva went to the lowest layers of hell where you learn from the Nagas, then use the mantra Ram, the primal sound Ram. He, when he screamed the Ram, he was able to rise back up through all the nether realms <laughs> and to attain his full godhood. <laughs> Is that one of the reasons why he's our pat- one of our patrons? And also because he's non shite? Well, a lot of it is because it's non shite. And what a lot of people don't understand, even though I keep saying it's a hundred times over, when Zoroaster created Zoroastrianism, or Zarathustra created Zoroastrianism, he took specifically 
the tantric entities, exp right down to specific agori, what we call Yatus, the sorcerer. So the agori is the model for the Yatus, and the deva or deva that they worship is the bad guys, the devils, if you will. <coughs> so they would Shiva with the snake being around his throat becomes Nahachian, Nanshite, Nahashin, uh, whichever name you want to use for it. They got four or five of them. For blasphemy or for discontentment. Uh, the symbology makes a lot more sense now. I mean, this is actually the, the serpent around him is the actual Naga Vasuki. The head one, right? The King Naga. He's the King Naga Vasuki. And the whole thing is, is the one of the main mythologies is. They were stirring the bowl of the world, the milk of the world. They couldn't turn the pillar. So the Asuras were on one side, the Devas were on the other. Vasuki sacrificed himself. They wrapped Vasuki around the main stone and they pulled the thing back and forth to churn the milk of the world in order to create the, the, the earth and a lot of other shit. The cosmos. Well, no, not the cosmos so much. More about the earth and the planets and stuff. Not so much the whole nine yards. More, more condensed. Yeah. Um, like candles. Yeah. And one of the things that, that occurred during this moving the Suki back and forth, they created the thing, and then there was the Asura or whatever you want to call them, fight against the Deva. So who would have control of it, right? Yeah, who would have control of the, the world? And then Vasuki attached itself to. Shiva, and therefore giving Shiva all knowledge of the underworld, the nether realms, and because he already had the power through Brahma, Shiva now has both knowledge of the higher realms, the lower realms, and the earth realm. So he's why he just lays around doesn't do anything. Yes, because <laughs> he has all the knowledge. He is the the male uh, potential, the power, the energy, the stored stuff that does nothing unless it's motivated. You have to have desire to motivate Shiva, which is what Shakti is. If you take away the gender concept of these gods, okay, there's no gender. You have the everlasting thing, the potential that's there. It's got a limitless power to do whatever the hell it wants. Non-gender, okay? Then you have the other thing called power. The power that creates desire to bring out the potential in a thing that's not going to do anything unless it has a reason to. The motivation. When you bring it and you take out the gender shit, because that seems to be a big argument, especially with what I've been studying, it's a huge argument. There's this constant, oh, this is male, this is female, this and that. Fuck the gender shit, okay? No gender. This is the potential, this is what makes the potential work, because it is a thing that creates a desire. Yeah, that makes sense. Without desire, the potential has nothing. So the positive can't interact without the negative, the negative can't interact without the positive. Yeah. They use the genders as symbolism to help make an understanding happen. But when it all boils down to Shiva Shakti. Now, whether you want to look at the negative forms of Shiva and Shakti being the Barahava or Barahaki, the two most destructive uh, forms of Shiva and Shakti, which is where Tantra spends a lot of time lying in, those are your destructive forms, or most destructive forms. But even at that point, they break down from there. So, specifically in Tantra that we're going to work with, and, and it's obviously going to be more akin to Aghori, it's not going to be so much of the female worship as most Tantra does. We're not going to be a Sakti set, we're going to be more closer, more akin to a Shivite set. Um, we're basically, we understand desire, we understand all this other stuff, but we're going to use the concept of corrupting ourselves to purify ourselves. But that's a whole big lengthy bunch of shit that I really don't want to explain to you guys because it's just a bunch of shit. And so bottom line is, we're taking on the negative, excuse me, the negative aspects of Ahriman, which is the devil. The model of the devil 
is the original concept of Angra Menu, which was originally a Persian spirit before Zoroaster ever came along, who was basically like a trickster god, like when he created um, Ozzy the Haka. And he created this thing to go kill everything. It's more than a trickster, it's a little more devious, but you get the point that I'm saying. So, when you read the story that's been redone, and by the time it gets through Zoroastrianism, basically what you have is Ariman initiating Ozzy Dahaka the same way the, the uh, Tantric gurus initiated. And then they talk about the two snakes, and I remember we were talking about the things that go down, the two major, like um, the medical thing, we've got the two snakes made up. Those are the two main uh, nerves that run up and down your spine. And he had the serpent's power of that coming out of his shoulders. And so he's been initiated. He's had, and when this, he talks about it, originally the soul is corrupt. Then he goes to the doctor. They cut the snakes off. Then the soul is taken out of him. And it goes off to the sky and blows up. And then there's different kinds of snakes. And now the snakes require two brains of two young males every day. Well, in other words, they're converting two Zoroastrians to the devil's work. Not that it's consuming people, but it's changing them over. It's corrupting them. Does that make more sense? So when you look at the paradigm, where they're specifically talking about Ozzy Dahaka, they're talking about Ariman being the guru. And if you get into Tantra, they talk about Shiva being the direct guru. So what you have to understand, when Zoroaster built his concept of Andhra Venu, or Ariman, it's a combination of both the Shiva and the old world Angra menu and you combine them together to make Ahriman. Mm. And obviously the Haka being the initiated by the guru of Ahriman to become the, you know, the worst, um, what do they call it? They don't call him a David, they call him a Druj. The most powerful Druj against Ahura Mazda's people as a whole. Does that make sense? Because so, it was physical. Yeah, and then we talk about it in the uh, Yasna every week. And that's what we're specifically talking about. So they're saying that Ahriman, as far as devil sorcery goes, coming from Zoroastrianism, leads back to a gory Shivatism, and which is where we're going. And we're not going to go that deep. I'm not going. We're not going to commit human sacrifices. We're not going to cut chickens' heads off and force people to drink the blood and shit like that. We're not going down that road. And we're going down the same realm that they use to corrupt their physical bodies to attain that city and that power. The same way she would attain all that power by going through hell. Does that make sense? So when you look at the construct of Brahma, um, Ahura Mazda, and Ahriman, you're looking at the same kind of concept. I'm oh, sorry, I messed that all that up. Zarvan and Brahma are basically the same. Ahura Mazda and Vedic Indra are basically the same. And then Shiva and Arjuna are the same. When you parallel them. Make sense now? Mm -hmm. Vishnu, Jai, Shakti, all that shit. It all just triples down. Well, in that case, how did Vedic Indra become one of the big palas? I chose Vedic Indra because there's a huge argument between scholars whether Indar and Indra are the same thing. Yeah, that was uh, something I've been noticing in nightly rituals. I just thought maybe it was another name for the same one. But, uh... The argument is, is that Indar freezes the mind of the righteous. He freezes the mind, he shocks them, he encapsulates them electrically. Well, Vedic Indra is the god of storm and lightning. The thing is, when you go troll through, Vedic Hinduism evolving, where Shiva basically beats his ass and says, you're now a subjugate of mine. That's when you have that. So, if you have, to me, if you have the subjugation of Shiva in the Vedic Indra, then it would make sense to showing to me that we may as well call Vedic Indra as well. Because they're always talking about Soma, Homa, Plant, and all that other shit in their Yasna. And they're saying that Ahura Mazda you know, it's the god of storm, the god of lightning, all that other bullshit, which is really just another form of Vedic Indra, but if we're corrupting Vedic Indra in the form of using it as a dar, then how much more of a blasphemy are we creating? 
Also, say, <coughs> also in the Yasna, we say uh, ours and none others may he be, don't we? Mm hmm. Is that to further corrupt it? Yes. We specifically want Vedic Indra focused on us. Because he on is. On our side. <laughs> yes, because he is a warrior god, he is a killer, he is a drunk, he is a fighter, he is a womanizer. I mean, if we ever need to go into battle, that's what we need. And obviously, since he was the king of the gods for a long time, he knows how to make battle plans and everything happen. He's our Starbuck. There you go. Plus, he is not locked away like our lives. So that's why we're going to use that guy versus Endar. Because honestly, Endar doesn't really, there's not much there. It's good, you know, to shock somebody, to stop somebody in their tracks. Basically, when I think of Endar, I think of, um, uh, God damn it. This is why I hate doing this at night because my mind isn't all focused. Um, cognitive dissonance. When I think of Indar, I think of him as a physicalization or a symbol of cognitive dissonance on other people. To create that, that, that stopping, that shock in people, and to make them question themselves on the inside, and to create that pain and that anguish of questioning that deep held belief that they've always had. Which is how he would tap into the concept of anguish of our does that make sense? So no, I did, I see them as two separate entities, but I think the scholastical argument is retarded. And that's all there is to it. I think there's a lot of scholastical arguments between some of these deities, like, um, what's the other one? Um, it goes back to, I think it's, uh, is it, no, it's not Swarga. It's uh, Aishma, and they try to trace Aishma back to a real simple, uh, a real simple uh, minor demon in the uh, Book of Persian Kings, and I don't agree with that either. Yeah. So, one of the decisions I have to make when I'm formulating for us is deciding what's serious, what's real, what has the most authentic feel to it, versus what these guys are nitpicking. Because there's a whole lot of missing information that's not there because of Alexander burning down and destroying the library. So there's a whole lot of crap that just doesn't exist anymore. So it's all speculation. So that's why I'd rather go by feel and how they feel in ritual, how they feel when I'm reading about them, how they feel when I'm interacting with them. Because right, whenever I do the nightly ritual or I use the, the uh, nightly prayer, uh, like Aishma does not feel like a minor demon. No, he's he's pretty aggressive. It's um, and the reason, <coughs> the reason that I assigned it the female gender of wrath is because the female warriors were very wrathful in Persia, and they were the ones who usually were standard spear uh, bearers. They usually fought with spears, where the men usually had the bow and arrows. And that's why, to me, if you're basing it off of the wounding spear, and it's supposed to be of wrath and anger, what well, would make more sense for it to be a, like a female Persian soldier? Yeah, and I get the female feel from it too as well. And this, or is Aishma biconvex? Well, they try to say that Aishma is male because they a lot of the interpreters can't get the Christian shit out of their head, so they automatically base the, the, the wounding spear to the spear of destiny that the Romans stabbed, supposedly stabbed Jesus with, mm -hmm. and that's why they can't break that gender issue. Fair enough. Because they, they really do. They, they, all, the, all these scholastics try to say that the Spear of Destiny and the Wounding Spear are the same spear. Yeah, but didn't the Wounding Spear come long before that? Yes. And it's actually technically like, um, you know how all the Deva have their weapons? Mm -hmm. Like, for example, um, he has the trident and the axe. That spear is like one of those spiritual weapons. But the one that Aishma carries specifically can attack a Horus and can attack the subtle body in people. So Aishma can specifically kill your spirit with that spear. Yeah, something I'm thinking though is that that doesn't really fit into the symbology of the, Je of the Jesus mythology. No. Like. Well, it's after the Spear of Destiny seemingly stabbed the Christ. That's when it became uh, a physical stopping force. Like it said that if it stabs you afterwards, even a minor cut from it, it will. Yeah. That's why Hitler and them were hunting it so hard as like one of the relics. Yeah. After that it became the Spear of Destiny. 
Yeah, but the, and that's then that's a reverse, and you see a lot of Catholicism where they reverse spiritual and the physical. You see yeah, it constantly. Well, yeah, it seems like uh, <clears throat> like okay. So Socrates had this question right about whether or not something was holy because it was holy, or whether or not it was holy because the gods liked it, and. It seems to me like from the Christian the Christian perspective, everything that is holy is holy because God likes it. God doesn't like it because it's holy. It's holy because God likes it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, and when you have that re, when you have that re, reversion or the reciprocation of whatever you want to call it, when when the Catholics came in and redid everything, yeah, you have a lot of that. What used to be a spiritual thing is now a physical thing, and then you have a, a further pushing the vision of what's good and what's bad. So rationalism is pretty open about what's good, what's bad, and you're going to do both and whatever, but Catholics are very, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is right, this is right kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And the, the fucked up thing is though, the more I study Tantra, the more I see the Catholic Mass offering flowers to the statues. The rosary or the Java Mala, the hymns, the, uh, the 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 reverence with the gods. Yeah, it's like once you start studying the older religion stuff, you see how much Christianity is twisted or inverted or stolen or just outright plagiarized. Yeah. Well, reading the Le Sorcier Witch, when he talks about the Catholics being a young religion, he said they gave him the flare, they gave him the all tools of the altar, they gave them the flowers and the uh, idols, or showed them. So he's talking about someone else, not the pagans, giving them the tools to perform ritual. It's probably what he's talking about. Well, you look at a lot of um, a lot of uh, Vedic expressions of ritual has like the puja worship, the individual worship, where you see that a lot with the Catholics and their Hail Marys and their individual home worship. But the Tantra worship, when they had the big Tantra things, is where you see like the, the mass coming from the Catholic mass and the flowers and the drinking, like the wine. Um, because in the Vedic, they would never drink wine, but in Tantra, they drink wine. Hmm. Hmm. Um, the coalescence of the blood and the body were being flesh. That leads back to either eating fish or eating some type of pig or cow flesh and tantra, which is completely outlawed in every other type of Hinduism. They don't do it. And it's, there's the five things that tantra will do that the others won't, which is, but it's only supposed to be in um, ritual, which is the wine, the meat, the fish, sex, so on. Uh, but anyway, so getting it all back down, these are our expressions or how we interact bodily wise with the physical and the ethereal and we'll build more on this next time but i hope that this begins to understand how everything that we do interacts with all the chakras and everything else because what i'm going to do next time i'm going to take the the mid chakras and i'm going to plug in what those chakras are in control of so, just to give a quick example, the, the basal chakra, the anus, obviously in control of eliminating. Um, and we'll plug all that together because it's also the earth element. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those chakras, I'm going to take these things, and I'm going to show you how they all blend in together, and then with the subtle body lays on top of that. And that way you see how all this interacts together. But you've got to have all the pieces before you understand the complete interaction. Make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, man.